Okay, a few it's more minutes. Your program is intended um, for the personal, let me introduce you commercial first. use of its listener and may not be reproduced for any commercial purpose without the written permission of Rex Crandall and CALDA. The policies, positions, views and opinions expressed and or provided herein are not those of the State Bar of California, CALDA or any entity associated therewith, and are strictly those of the authors or speakers. No representations or guarantees of any kind are made with respect to the accuracy of the written, visual, oral or audio portions of this presentation and nothing herein should be relied upon to answer any legal questions. The written, oral or visual information expressed or provided herein should not be relied upon in dealing with any specific legal matter. No attorney-client or CPA-client relationship is created by any part of this educational program and related activities. Attorneys, CPAs or LDAs using the information expressed and provided herein in dealing with a specific client or clients, and their own legal matters should also research original sources of authority. Okay. Hello everyone, uh, welcome um, to this session. We're going to be discussing, uh, we're going to be discussing income taxation for estates and trusts. Uh, again, our presenter is uh, Rex Crandall. Uh, Rex's uh, law firm, um, Rex has many years of experience in bookkeeping, accounting, financial statement preparations, audits, reviews, and consulting. He's prepared thousands of income tax returns from simple to the most complex, including individuals, businesses, um, small and large. And he also uh, does uh, corporations, estate, and, and his firm also does estate planning, probate, um, wills and trusts and things of that nature. A uh, little bit of a housekeeping here. If you guys have any questions, please go ahead and type them in the Q&A as it is sometimes difficult to follow along in the chat. So once again, if you have any questions, um, put them in the Q&A and depending upon where we are in the presentation, we will either go and take questions, you know, in, in the middle of the presentation or we'll just hold the, the questions to the end. Okay, thank you. Over to oh. you, Rhett. Thank you, Michelle Dejeuner. Greetings, everyone. Today we have a topic that's uh, a little thicker than some of the other ones, thicker meaning density of law, but it's really an essential part of estate planning because as soon as somebody passes away, they're also in the legal system and in the tax system. And this class is not designed so that you learn how to actually prepare a large volume of state income tax returns. But what I'm trying to do is give you clues and guidance that when you're working with a situation, something's going to jump out at you and you say, oh my gosh, this is something that you need to look at. And um, that's, that's the purpose. I'm going to uh, go through the materials that I've made available to you on our online uh, drive. The first is uh, a part of the book that I wrote on comprehensive estate planning. This is just a real small segment of that. Um, and these materials are, we're not gonna go through them in great detail at the moment, but they're here for you to look at later. And I'm just telling you now, I'm not teaching these pages. I'm just telling you they're here. This one is a tax return where there's no tax. We've pumped out all the taxable income to the beneficiaries. And then we have another one that it's all taxed to the trust. And, and the whole tax return is here, and we're working just in the front parts. Um, 
but it's way more information than we can cover in a program like this. Okay, I have included computer input sheets. And the first thought most people would say is, so what big deal? What do I need to look at that for? If you ever do start doing preparing in here, uh, state income tax returns, the way that it's done, it's not like um, a lot of times we get fillable forms like judicial counsel forms and things. Doing income tax preparation is not that way. We have input forms. And after all, the input forms are keyed in on the computer. Then the computer program crunches everything. And on the output, you look at the tax return. So it's a little bit different than um, estate planning software. And it's much different than just a fillable PDF. And, and that's just a, an example of what the computer input sheets look like. Uh, Okay, so we have slide deck, okay. And, oh, this uh, is a real thorough checklist for professionals preparing fiduciary income tax returns from the AICPA, the National CPA Group. And it covers a huge amount of issues that if you're looking, you're worried you're gonna miss something, this is the checklist that you go through. So, and there's some other material there you can look at uh, online uh, at your leisure. Okay. So these are the learning objectives. We're going to be doing income tax of estates and trust. There's a federal form we'll talk about, IRS form 1041 in a California form 541. Whenever you talk about estate taxes, there's automatically, most of the time, an ambiguity because people think estate and inheritance tax, and that's not our subject tonight. We're talking about just the income tax part of it. Uh, we answer the question, if you have to pay tax after death, we go through important definitions. We show you the income tax brackets for estates and trusts. And then we compare them to how that would impact an individual. We answer whether you can amend a trust after the death of the first spouse. And do, do estates and trusts pay higher income tax than individuals? And we cover a couple methods where the estate income tax return would pay no income tax. And we go through stepped up basis at date of death and why a beneficiary should care about that. Um, we go through the definitions of a simple trust and a complex trust. And the legal entities are a little tricky for people in the beginning. They don't realize that there's that many legal entities when somebody passes away. And uh, so we're going to clear that up. And we're going to go through the difference between a bypass trust and a, an amendable survivor trust. How to determine if a bypass trust has ever been funded, if it was in the documents. Uh, how many income tax returns need to be filed in a year when the first spouse dies? And how many income tax returns need to be filed when the second spouse dies? We're covering the in-kind distributions, which is a non-cash, and how the beneficiary treats it on their personal tax return. And the documents to inform the beneficiary of their tax basis. I point out in the beginning, this material is thicker than a lot of other material because it's tax. And if you feel as we go through there that it's uh, like going over your head, uh, don't worry. You can go back and 
play the audio or video again, and it might help, you know, hearing it a second time. If by chance we went too fast for you the first time, we're not, I'm not trying to go fast, but people who don't have the vocabulary, it might appear that way. So in jest, the four, four laws of accounting, trial balances don't balance. Bank reconciliations never do. Working capital does not. And return on investment never will. So that dispels a lot of myths. Um, and we're going to cover the flow of taxability. And right off the bat, we're going to be leaving the probate code. And most material with estate planning revolves around the California probate code. We're leaving that almost entirely because we're going over on the federal side dealing with the income tax. And in the tax arena, the uh, feds are the elephant in the room. California has their tax, but they're just kind of following along. Income taxes for trusts and estates. It's not surprised when somebody dies, they might have assets that continue to generate income. And in the code itself, it says the taxable income of a state is in the same manner as an individual, which means it kind of mirrors the stuff that you need to do an individual tax return, but this is on an estate. And there's very similar deductions. It's not completely foreign on a fiduciary income tax return compared to an individual's personal tax return. So there's quite a, a lot of 1041s or fiduciary income tax. There's a bit of a, a rights and audits in this area, especially on the higher income uh, areas. And there's a reporting requirement there's trust and there's an estate and there are separate entities which we will cover um income prior to the death of the creator of the trust does not go on this tax return anywhere it everything falls uh, income and deduction falls on their personal 1040 tax return and Assets that have right of survivorship, like a surviving spouse, do not get reported on this tax return. And I'll emphasize it again that a state income tax is not a state and inheritance tax on IRS Form 706. There has been some horrendous litigation between attorneys and accountants. The attorney says, Oh, you're doing the estate tax return. And the CPA says, oh, you're doing the estate tax return. And they're talking about different returns. One's talking about a 1041 and the other one's talking about a 706. And if you miss the tax payments in a inheritance tax return, 706, you can have humongous penalties, but we're not gonna cover that at all because none of my clients with a couple exceptions have assets over $12 million per spouse. And if that's the case, yes, you want to start looking into an IRS form 706. So what, as an income tax repair, we have clients coming in every year and they have an estate plan and we're just doing a married couple every year. And then at some point they get a, a comprehensive estate plan and a revocable living trust. And then the next year, the surviving spouse comes in and tells me that the other spouse passed away during the year. And so now we're starting to get into some of the motions for estate income tax. Um, and then we're doing, uh, in that case, when you have a surviving spouse and the um, at the end of the year, the surviving spouse is unmarried. 
And the way it's done for tax purposes is the surviving spouse at the end of that year still files a 1040 for all the income. And it doesn't matter that the spouse died during the year for the tax reporting. It shows up on the upper left of the tax return, the deceased spouse and date of death. But everything is on a, on a 1040 uh, individual tax return. Um, then what happens is a few years go by with the surviving spouse and then we get a call from a son or daughter and they tell us that their parent uh, both of the parents now are deceased and so at this point we're going into another level of income tax returns for estates and then what we're looking for at that point is income up to the date of death gets put on a personal tax return and income received from assets after the date of death are on a fiduciary income tax return and if it's if you have income in assets of a decedent over 600 during the year you're going to be filing a fiduciary income tax return Okay, and then when the second spouse passes away, we do a search to try to find if there's other assets that might be generating income. And then the process of uh, post-mortem estate administration also has started separately from the income tax side. Um, we get, um, when the, the second spouse dies, we get, you know, 1099s or K1s from vendors, and they don't always allocate the K1s or the 1099s properly up until the date of death. So what we end up doing, if we have a 1099 for an entire year, and the, the second spouse died during the year, we just do a proration and show the amount of income earned before death and the amount of income earned after death and tell IRS that we're not following exactly what shows on the 1099. And sometimes, you know, the, these 1099s go off to IRS and they've got a situation they call it 1099 matching where IRS, um, looks at the income from a bank or a stockbroker and says, uh, oh, this income here, and they want to file, they want to look at a tax return. And there's no tax return because of the situation. Maybe it was reported on some other return. So what we do to keep the uh, IRS inquiries down is when we split a 1099 or a W-2, we cross-reference the other taxpayer ID number so the IRS can cross-reference and see that we reported everything properly and show them the computations. Okay, so this is, we have this first example and this is probably the most shocking thing to me anyway. When you're dealing with a income tax on estates and trust is the very high tax brackets. So in this example, we have 86,000 of taxable income and it's 33,000 of tax. And that's just federal. When the estate or trust keeps the money within the trust. And in terms of terminology, I want to emphasize that if somebody's going through a pro when somebody dies and they have a will or no will, an estate is created. So if you have a probate, we're dealing with an estate. And a trust is a separate situation. And so when somebody dies and they have a trust and it becomes irrevocable, non-changeable, we really have two entities at that point. 
an estate and a trust. And I will show you the system that we use to keep the income tax out of the estate income tax return by making distributions to the beneficiaries so that the beneficiaries can pay their pay the income tax at their lower tax brackets. And this is an example of a K-1 being distributed to a beneficiary. Okay, a K-1 happens in a lot of different tax returns, not just estates. They happen in partnerships and LLCs. They happen in S corporations, and we're talking about the 1041. So it's um, these particular entities have an entity reporting and then splitting out to the owners or the beneficiaries, income gets allocated out of the entity and is characteristic for all of these entities. This is a enlargement of a K-1 where we have a 1041 fiduciary income tax return for the decedent's estate, or it could be a trust. And then we show money going out to the beneficiary and what the beneficiary does on their personal tax return is they pick up these numbers. So I had dividends, I had interest income, I had capital gains, uh, net rental income. And that goes and gets transferred to the individual recipient, in this case, the beneficiaries, uh, individual form 1040. Now, this is the worst scenario we get sometimes. So we have a K-1 to a beneficiary or a shareholder or a partner, and when we're doing the individual tax return, we have to go through all of these lines and place things throughout the tax return. So this is a, an example of a K-1 that came from a trust and all these line items have to go and be, show up on the individual person's personal tax return. Okay, yeah, it's kind of a lot, but at the end of the day, the individual is paying income tax at a lower bracket than the trust would have. So we have two scenarios. One is the income, uh, we have an income received deduction, which is the amount that we can allocate and uh, pass through to the beneficiaries. There's some numerical limits. And then if the money never gets distributed out of the trust or estate, then the trust gets stuck with the income tax. Um, as a estate planning drafting suggestion, you might consider including a paragraph that says during post-mortem administration of trust and estate in this situation, that all income every year needs to be distributed to the beneficiary, then we don't have this uh, cat and mouse game where we have to transfer money out of the um, estate income tax return. And the trust just says, you got to distribute it. It makes it simpler. And which is different than a complex trust where the income's not required to be distributed every year, and most of them are not distributed until the final year when all the assets are gone and distributed. So in the final year of a trust administration, frequently what we have is prior tax returns with carryover losses, that carry over to the next year and we bring them to the, the subsequent year estate income tax return. And then in the final year, last tax return that we're ever gonna have to do because the estate administration is done, then any all the trust, the tax attributes all fall into the beneficiary's tax returns including administrative expenses, um, 
capital loss carry forwards, net operating loss, passive losses. This this is an example of things that flow out of the fiduciary income tax return onto your personal tax return. So when someone dies, their social security number is frozen and it can't be used anymore. And most banks will freeze all bank accounts. Stock brokers will freeze all bank uh, stock accounts. And the trust, successor trustee or administrator or executor has to get another ID number for this newly created entity, whether it's an estate or a trust or both. And they end up calling these things um, employer identification numbers, but it's kind of misleading because most estates and trusts never have any employees. And uh, once in a while, we'll have uh, a senior who has employees while they're alive, and then we have to do payroll tax. But in this case, all we're doing and talking about is the successor trustee or administrator has to get a new ID number so that the bank accounts can be opened into the estate and trust name. So you can apply for this employer identification number, which I will always refer to as a taxpayer ID because there's no employees. So you can apply for this online. You can apply faxing a form by mail and it takes forever or you can apply by telephone. Uh, what we do for clients is uh, we get them by the clients in, in the office and we just go online and get it from IRS and print out the new ID number. Okay, so we have a new ID number for the estate or trust. Now we have tax issues and the decedent is not going to be um, signing any more tax returns quite obviously. And the executor, successor, trustee, and even for the deceased individual representative, um, is going to be doing the tax returns for the decedent. And this particular form, IRS Form 56, alerts IRS that says, hey, don't send the tax forms or notices to this address anymore. I'm in charge as administrator or successor trustee and you need to send everything to me, tax notices. So this is something that's done frequently right after we get the, um, the new taxpayer identification number. Real simple form. Okay, how do you read a trust for income tax purposes? Most people don't. But... If there's going to be asset income generated after death, somebody's got to do it. So when both sellers are still alive, everything falls in on the 1040. You want to verify that it really is a revocable trust, which verifies that any income goes on the 1040. And look for any terms that may have created an irrevocable trust because when a trust becomes irrevocable, non-changeable, you have another entity created and the need for a taxpayer identification number and perhaps tax returns. Look in the trust document for words like bypass trust, AB trust, split interest trust, special needs trust, or often there'll be uh, sub-trust for a beneficiary who's under 18, a minor, and you have to keep a separate trust. A, a beneficiary under 18 cannot inherit more than $5,000 without special guardianship. Uh, so that oftentimes creates another trust. And at first it sounds kind of unusual. You have one big trust, okay? And you say, what are sub-trusts? Well, this one big trust tells you, you have to split in the first day. You got to do this and you have to split it that way. 
And each one of those required splits create a subtrust for estate and trust administration purposes. And it flows from the text in the trust instrument. Okay, so do I have to pay income tax after I'm dead? Unfortunately, the answer is yes. And that is when you're going through life, you have income, you pay tax on it, obviously. But if you have income from assets, you pay tax on that. And then when somebody dies, those assets continue to generate income. And even though you're dead, you're still paying income tax on the income generated from your assets. And you have an income tax filing requirement when the income goes over $600 for a year. If you have no assets generating income after death, then you do not have to file um, a separate tax return. And we get these types of tax returns that are kind of left over from many, many years ago called AB trusts. And there's a separate trust for the survivor that's amendable and changeable and a separate trust that's irrevocable, non-changeable for the deceased spouse. And for that situation, the irrevocable trust for the deceased is a separate tax paying entity on a fiduciary income tax return. And the surviving spouse ends up with a survivor trust that is still changeable and amendable. And all that income goes on his or her individual tax returns. Okay, definitions to understand what's going on here. So when a person dies, they, it creates an estate. If they have a will or don't have a will, it still creates what we call an estate. And when the assets market value get above 184,500, you not only have an estate, but you have a probate case. Revocable living trust, that's the normal estate planning document created. It's amendable and changeable. Normally, those trusts become irrevocable and non-changeable at the death of one spouse or both spouse. And a simple trust, it, that simple trust is a checkbox on the uh, tax return says you must distribute all the income. And a complex trust does not have to distribute all the income. And this is more common. Um, and then we have to try to get the money out of the trust to pay less tax. The term grantor trust is used in the tax code. And it's just another way of saying that any income that this entity has received goes directly to the individual's Form 1040. So let's say that somebody has an estate plan and they die and they've got assets and they have a trust and an estate. So in this example, when they pass away, an estate is created and the irrevocable trust. And if either of them have over $600 of income in that entity, then you're doing the um, state income tax return. A trustee, um, and I just point out the terminology. For simplicity, I usually call everybody a trustee, but that includes an administrator. The way these words work is if the person died without a will or the person appointed by the probate court is not named in the will, California likes to call them an administrator. Everybody I know thinks they're an executor. But an executor has a special meaning in California law that says that the will appointed Uncle Joe as executor. And Uncle Joe is the executor when the probate's filed. Okay, he gets to use the term executor. Not a great distinction. Um, a split interest trust, and this creates some accounting problems. Uh, defining a split interest trust, we have one beneficiary 
getting all the income from the trust. We have a separate beneficiary saying, when this trust is over, give everything that's left over to the residuary beneficiary. Those two parties have always a conflict of interest because the residual owner only gets what's left. And the beneficiary for the income part wants to take everything. And there are specific accounting rules about how that allocation is done. And there's been quite a bit of litigation in that area. We get calls from potential clients that say, I, I just inherited X thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars. Do I have to pay income tax on that money? Where, how much income tax do I have to pay on my inheritance? Uh, the general answer is you don't. There is no income tax on a bequest that you receive from an estate. Um, there are exceptions, of course, in the law. If the trustee never paid the income tax, beat the government out of money, maybe the government would go after the money or the assets to the beneficiary, but generally not. So there's another exception to no tax on inherited money, and that is in qualified plans. So if a beneficiary receives a traditional IRA or a 401k pension or an annuity, when that asset is received as a bequest, there's no tax due. But when they take the money out, there is tax due. And right now in the tax law, when you inherit an IRA or a pension, the law says that you have to take out that money before 10 years. So you, if you don't, there's going to be a large penalty. So you can take out the money. And, and the reason why it's a big deal is everything you take out gets taxed. So you might want to take out one tenth a year until the tenth year. Fine. Other people, they decide I'm not taking any of it out. I'm going to take it all in the the ninth year and the ninth month and pay all the income tax way down the road. Um, if you inherit a Roth IRA, then it is not taxable when the assets are distributed out of that particular type of IRA. The split interest trust, which I just defined a moment ago, where the income goes to one person, the residual goes to someone else. These are the rules within the trust accounting that has to be followed by the trustee. If you get interest in dividends, it gets in, goes into the income bucket. If it goes to uh, capital gains, it goes to the principal bucket of income. Um, proceeds on capital gains, principal, rental income goes to income. Trustees fees get split between principal and income. And so does investment advisor fees and accounting and tax preparation fees. But if you have capital gains on sale, that goes to principal. And paying interest on the survivor's house, the mortgage interest, gets allocated as a deduction against income. Okay, so the income tax brackets in an estate income tax return are condensed. And that's a polite, a polite way of saying they're much higher at lower income. So this is the, the tax brackets. And you know, from an individual tax return, you get a lot more slack before you have to pay these percentages of tax. But in the early 90s, President Clinton signed a bill that allowed the condensing of the tax brackets, I guess all those rich trust fund babies or something, uh, or that the estates and trusts don't vote, so we're going to tax them a lot. Um, so our current system, and there's no impetus to change it, Whenever an estate or trust has more than 13,451, 13,000 and change in taxable income, you're already up in the 37% bracket, which is high. So 
we'll look at it differently here. Um, capital gains also have a condensed tax bracket schedule in an estate income tax return. It's more favorable. And California, doesn't matter whether it's an individual tax return or state and trust, California wants to tax all capital gains at ordinary income tax brackets. Now, this is the real clincher in this example about tax brackets. So we're saying there's income. Let's say there's 20, 30,000 of income in the estate or trust. Well, you've got to pay 37%, everything above 13,000 and change. And you compare that, what would it be if this was an individual or the person was alive? Well, the tax brackets don't hit 37% until the taxable income of a single individual is $539,000. So you can see that the tax brackets are stretched over a much larger income uh, allocation. And this is one of the major reasons we don't wanna have income, taxable income left in a trust or estate because of the um, high tax brackets. So this is an example of an estate or trust income tax return. And in this example, we have like 86,000 of taxable income and nothing was distributed to the beneficiary. So we have what, 33,000 of, of taxable income on the Fed tax return. We have a state return to do also. On, Cal, on, on the uh, other type of trust where we distributed out all the income to the beneficiaries, income's gone. There's no tax on this tax return. And that's what I like to see. I don't like my clients paying tax. So we go back to the tax return and we bring in California. So on this 33,000 of taxable income, California gets their pound of flesh and they want 5,000. So it makes about 38,000 of taxable income or tax, actual tax on 86,000 of income. That's almost half. So the problem is almost half of the taxable income gets wasted in payments of tax. And in this case, so that's almost 48% tax. When we go over to the individual, the individual on that same taxable income, we've got a certain amount going to federal and state, and it ends up only being around 16,000 and change taxable if we get the income out to the beneficiary. Um, if you decide to run for politics, you can look this over. It has some ideas on uh, having, um, creating and passing tax law leg legislation. Okay. What are common in income items for estates or trusts? Certificates of deposits, bonds, anything that decedent would have owned, mutual funds, rental property, savings, stocks. We're looking for 1099s for all those assets. Are funeral expenses deductible? No. Simple answer. You just don't deduct them. Uh, trust and estate management fees. These are deductible for the administration of the estate. And so you have a wider latitude of deductible items for an estate or trust than you do on an individual tax return. Items such as investment management fees, uh, expenses required for rental property maintenance, um, expenses to main the maintain the decedent's residence is a tax deduction. It wouldn't be if you were on a 1040 uh, tax return. 
bookkeeper costs, CPA fees, attorney's fees, executor and management fees, all those are deductible on the estate income tax return. When an estate or trust has non-taxable income, it creates an allocation process that we have to do on the tax return because you cannot deduct administrative expenses when the income that caused them was never even taxed. So an example here, let's say that the estate or trust had 20,000 of income and half of it was from tax-free municipal bonds. So in all the administrative costs related to that income, we can only take half of the expense that was paid. Okay, so we're gonna go through some scenarios here and we're, the objective is to learn about basis. And the first example is we have father and daughter and the house is in joint tenancy and the father and or just the father and possibly the daughter bought the house originally for a hundred thousand a long time ago now the house is worth a million and when one of the joint tenants dies it's called by operation of law the survivor owns everything because that's what the deed says to do it doesn't matter if your trust says something else. It doesn't matter if the will says something else. The survivor owns everything. And I'll just say overall, joint tenancy is not a good idea. So what happens on the daughter who now owns 100% of this house? Well, the daughter in this example had bought half of the house originally for 50,000. Okay. Then when dad dies, we get what's called a stepped up basis under Internal Revenue Code Section 1014. And stepped up basis is a big deal. And what it does allows you to get out of paying capital gains tax. And the reason is they let you do that because at one time we were, a lot of estates were paying inheritance tax. And since the assets could be subject to inheritance tax, we still have this stepped up basis. Okay, so let's backtrack and tie into this. They both own 50-50. Let's say dad dies, now daughter owns everything. She originally owned half it anyway, and she just inherited dad's half. He gets a step up on basis on his half, and the daughter's new tax basis is 550,000. If she was to sell, the house tomorrow, we'd say sale price less this 550. And I'll say again, joint tenancy is not a good idea. So a normal distribution from a trust or an estate. So I'll twist the example that father's deceased, his trust owned 100% of the house. The daughter owns nothing before father's death. And dad bought it for 100000 the house originally. Now it's inflated dollars. It's worth a million. And the trust, if it's in the trust or even as an individual, does not recognize any income because of the father's death. It does not recognize income tax. And the tax basis, the capital gains are forgiven, even though he paid originally 100000 now he died. Now for tax purposes, the house for calculating gain or loss is starting out at one million, which is way better than what the daughter had originally. And if the house is distributed in kind to daughter, then her basis for gain or loss the next day is one million. And to define the term in kind, it has nothing to do with being nice, although I think it's kind of nice getting an inheritance. Uh, what that means in, in a state and trust is that the assets were not sold. 
the asset was distributed as an asset to the beneficiary. And we frequently do that with large stock portfolios because we don't want the broker to sell all the stocks and then turn around and buy them for the beneficiary to get commissions on both sides. Um, so we do an in-kind distribution, just send pump the stocks out as a distribution. Now, a third way, we're still covering stepped up basis and another way of holding title in a community property state like California is to hold title is uh, ma and pa cattle as community property with right of survivorship. Okay, what this says is it's telling the world that they own the property and community property, they both own half. And the right of survivorship ends up acting like joint tenancy. The surviving spouse automatically ends up owning 100% of the asset, uh, subject to some paperwork filings. And so in the example, we're still, the surviving spouse gets a stepped up, if, assuming there were two spouses and one still alive. Um, and so that's a, a much better result. And whenever we see a married couple with property held in joint tenancy, we get that out of joint tenancy right away. You don't want to leave it in joint tenancy. It's bad. And there's another problem with joint tenancy. Some people will put half the house in the name of a kid. Then the kid gets a big judgment against them. And then the creditors come and take grandma's house. Not a good result. So this result that the surviving spouse gets 100% step up is because of the community property laws. And we have some allocations between trusts um, that take place if the beneficiaries are not the same between the husband and wife's um, distribution plan. So distributing assets to beneficiaries is a good idea. However, if you sold an example where the $1 million house, we frequently get, um, estates and trusts where the house just went up in value a million dollars and in the, doesn't matter they only paid twenty thousand for it and then right after that all the beneficiaries decide hey we're going to sell it well there's not going to be any gain or loss because if the house is worth a million dollars at the date of death and the market's not fluctuating that much when you sell it at a million dollars or somewhere around that the house sale closing costs are going to exceed the income. So you're going to end up with a, a net loss. Okay. So this is another feature of a fiduciary income tax return called the income distribution deduction. You will recall that I said I don't like the income to stay in a trust. I want it out to the beneficiaries. Well, this term is the term for the math that has to be done to be able to tell you, yes, you can distribute this much to the beneficiaries. So it divides uh, the assets. Our computer don't really tells us what to do on these. Uh, we have all the deductions and everything, and we have an income received deduction. And... Uh, one of the nice things is sometimes it comes in handy. Somebody forgets to take the income out of the trust and the tax bracket's going to be high. Well, the tax code allows you to backdate a distribution up to 65 days after the end of the year. So if you were in the end of February and you forgot to take your distribution from the trust and you're going to get clobbered tax wise you can still take that distribution and put on the tax return it applied to the prior year kind of a defensive tactic um okay i already mentioned that because of a state inheritance tax we get a stepped up basis 
Mm. Nothing new there. Uh, this is an example of what happens, say the decedent had a rental property and um, there were, um, it's just going along on a schedule E with an appreciation schedule. The house, when it, they bought it was 500,000. We can't not depreciate land because dirt doesn't depreciate. The building in the government's infinite wisdom says it's going to last 27 and a half years. So we claim deduction on the building component. And this is during the time when they're alive and we're doing it, the tax reporting on a 1040. Then the surviving spouse dies and that rental property is still there. Well, now we have a stepped up basis. And so that rental schedule just changed because we step up the basis to market value with an appraisal as of date of death. And then we take out the allocation of land that doesn't depreciate and we get a huge increase and, and it saves money later uh, because of this depreciation and depreciation is good because you get a tax deduction, but no money is being paid out to anyone. And this is within the trust or estate. And if the trustee distributes in kind to the beneficiary, the beneficiary's depreciation schedule will look like this also. Let's say there are a lot of assets being distributed to beneficiaries not being sold. The beneficiary is going to sell the assets at some point. They need to be told what their basis is in that asset. And uh, this gets quite detailed when there's a large stock portfolio. It's not so bad on a, a few buildings. Um, so it's the trustee telling the beneficiary, okay, we gave you this house, we gave you this rental, we gave you this stock portfolio. And when you sell this stuff, this is your basis for gain or loss. Um, the purpose of the stepped up basis, it really benefits the um, beneficiary because of less uh, tax due. <laughs> we had one situation where a beneficiary received grandpa's stock portfolio. And she requested to have a distribution in kind, not sold. And so she got the stock account in her name. And then the stockbroker forgot to apply the step up basis rules to the portfolio that she had. And when some of the stocks were sold by the beneficiary, the IRS stepped in and said, hey, you have more capital gains. The return was done right, but the broker had messed up by leaving the historic cost basis. And on that particular situation, uh, we had to bring the case to U.S. tax court uh, to be resolved. And we do bring cases to tax court occasionally, um, not on a regular basis, because we can usually um, come to a negotiated settlement with the IRS. The income distribution deduction, as I mentioned, this is important to get the money out of the trust. So it's calculated by taxable income less capital gains, less exemptions, like a big deal, $600. And then the rest can be distributed. Okay, so when somebody dies, it's counterintuitive, but two entities are created if they have a state plan. There's an estate that's created and there's a trust. And now we have two entities. And if they both have income, dang, we have to do two tax returns because both of them have over $600 of income. Well, we don't like to waste resources. 
So under Internal Revenue Code Section 645, it allows us to merge two entities into one for tax reporting purposes, which saves a lot of effort. And we make that election on IRS Form 8855. If you are administering a trust, say you're a successor trustee, and you see that there's S corporation stock, this should be a big red flag for you, and you need to get on it right away. Because for some reason, the government doesn't like estates and trusts owning S corps, I think because it messes up their flow through uh, and taxability. So, what you want to do if you have an S corp within a state or trust is try to get it distributed to the beneficiary within two years from death, and you can avoid most of the problems. Um, sophisticated estate planners have tools like a qualified subchapter S trust or a testamentary trust and, and um, ESBT trust, which I'm not going to go into, but it doesn't matter. Still get the asset out of the um, trust administration because what happens is the S Corp can lose its S Corp election. And when that happens, it treats the S Corp as if it was just sold at its fair market value. It's just going along, nothing different. But if the S Corp election is revoked, that creates a large sale and creates a lot of tax for no benefit. It's all downside. Who reports the income? Well, you might have a 1040 for a couple, a spouse, 1041 for an estate. You might have a 1041 for a trust. You might have both an estate and a trust. A beneficiary might be having a separate tax return reporting. There's a lot of different ways than tax returns, especially when there's a lot of income being generated. So, in the beginning of the year, husband and wife were alive. During the year, one of the spouses dies, creates an estate and a trust, and a surviving spouse. The surviving spouse is allowed to file married filing jointly for the year of death. And for two years thereafter, if there's a uh, dependent child. And the tax bracket married filing joint is a more favorable tax bracket than using the single person tax bracket. Um, this is an example when somebody passes away, they've got various income components. And after they pass away, what tax is uh, takes place. Uh, we didn't talk about pay on death or transfer on death assets yet. Um, if you have an estate or trust describing these assets, it has no effect on them. If it's in a will or in a trust, it has no effect at all. What these are is the person when they were alive made a, an agreement with the vendor that says, on my death, give the money to Sonny Boy or daughter niece, whatever. Um, and the, I advise people not to use these a lot because what happens when they're overused is it sucks the money out of the trust and estate administration as a distribution. And then it causes the estate or trust to become insolvent because all the money went away. And there's things that needed to be done. Um, it causes problems in the short answer. Uh, client creates a joint trust during a year. They're both grantors. What happens? Well, it's a revocable, changeable trust, and all their income still stays on their 1040. What would happen if you had two revocable trusts, one husband, one wife? Well, no difference. 
any income that comes from any assets will go on a personal 1040. Uh, here's the pay on death. The items are taxable to the decedent up to the date of death, and they're taxable to the beneficiary from the date of death. Um, aunt distributes a gift to niece for 20000 What happens? Well, you may have heard that if you give a gift over $16,000 during a year to one beneficiary, you're now required to file a gift tax return. It's IRS form 709. And I hear many people say you have to file a gift tax return and pay tax. And pay tax is not true. You have a reporting obligation to report to the IRS on form 709 that a gift of above 16,000 was given. And it doesn't really affect the uh, the giver that much. I suppose part of it, IRS, if one of the beneficiaries all of a sudden ends up with a lot of money and the IRS thinks that it's all untaxed, uh, they can trace it backwards uh, to the donor. But this is a carryover from when a state and inheritance tax was activated at a much lower asset level. Okay, so what happens? Uncle's got three limited liability companies and we're doing estate planning and we move um, the assets, a bill of sale for the LLCs into the grantor trust, which means revocable or changeable. How do you report it? You don't, it's no big deal. It's a revocable trust. The revocable trust owns those assets, no change. Now, what if uncle dies? Then we have a different scenario. And there again, people are not usually convenient and dying on December 31 or January 1. So we end up having a K-1. We'll end up with six K-1s for one person. Three before death, three K-1s after death to report on the various tax returns. Uh, okay, the uh, surviving spouse um, ends up reporting all the income on it, an individual tax return. The certificates of deposit, anything on, on pay on death is gone. Um, partnership names, they need to be transferred. And any of the assets that remain in the surviving spouse his name are are not reported any different than any individual. Okay, so we have a, an estate income tax return. We have a net operating loss created, let's say from a business or perhaps a rental property. And the assets are not distributed for two years. So we have losses being created in the trust or estate and then it's taxed if, if it's gained and then in the final year of administration then those tax attributes drop out to the individual okay so this is a chart going from um, no distribution person being live at the beginning of the year, they pass away during the year and their assets go from filing on a joint 1040. Now we're going to have a 1041. Um, if one of the spouses die, we might, and it was an AB trust, we might have a fiduciary tax return and a individual income tax return. If they have a joint trust, and one of the spouse or both uh, one of the spouses dies and the trust remains revocable and changeable, then only a 1040 is due to be filed at the end of the year. 
Okay. So the trust itself says that all the distributions need to be made uh, only in the final year, causes problems during the year, um, on, during the years until it's distributed. Another trust says uh, only distribute in the final year. So we accumulate things. Um, and it's just a, a dichotomy back and forth, whether you're able to give deductions, uh, distributions or not. And um, we do everything we can to keep the trust from paying tax. Now, how do you know when a trust terminates? If the term of the trust expires, the purpose of the trust has been fulfilled let's say all the assets are gone, rarely, but uh, the purpose of the trust becomes unlawful. And on the termination of the trust, it's like there's nothing left. It's like an empty paper bag. The, nothing really happens. You do a final, you check the box on a, a state income tax return that this is the final year and nothing really happens. You get off the mailing list. And me as a tax preparer, and we get K-1s from clients, we're always looking in the upper part of the form in the right to see whether the box is checked that says, this is the final K-1. And we say, good, we don't have to wait for this thing next year. And I tell you, people who have K-1s, they are always filing after April 15th, guaranteed. You know, just people can't get the K-1s prepared soon enough. Anyway, the trust is terminated when there's nothing left to do. Now, remember we filed a form, IRS Form 56 that said, hey, IRS, I'm in charge. Send all the papers to me. Now we're at the other end of the cycle. And the trust has been terminated, you want to file with IRS a form 5495 to tell IRS, hey, I'm out of here. Don't send any more to me. We're done. Uh, but this is something different. And normally, uh, if a trustee or executor goes through and they pay all the de ass deductions and debts and does not pay the income tax, the income tax doesn't go away. It ends up being a personal liability of the trustee or executor. And if the assets are distributed, when there's a tax liability that they call a transfer liability, the income taints the assets that are coming out to the beneficiary. Translated, it's a mess. So this form allows you to limit your liability to a shorter period of time of six months rather than being exposed to liability for three years. Um, overall, I want to make a comment about uh, integrity. It's uh, very important, I think, in uh, the world. I think that the whole world only functions because of integrity, and I encourage everybody to do things honestly, ethically, morally, and do what's right, no matter if anybody knows about it or not, because that's what holds society together and the world together. Okay, so in summary, we've had an exciting discussion about IRS Form 1041, fiduciary income tax return and what the tax impact of various transactions, how you got to file tax returns if it's over $600. That's a summary. Okay, if this material has sparked an interest in you that you now are so excited about income tax that you want to become a registered, California registered tax preparer, you can do that by taking a class and getting this state license. If you wanna go one step higher and you wanna become an IRS enrolled agent, uh, with this license, you can do tax all the, across the entire country. 
Uh, it's a hard, more difficult test. <clears throat> I've got both of those um, licenses. But if you're interested in becoming a tax repairer, contact our office. We'll get you information on uh, licensing. Uh, in epilogue, if you have an interest in reading, you can buy my book, Comprehensive Estate Planning, available on Amazon. We also have a YouTube channel called Estate Planning California, Rex Crandall Firm. And we endeavor to put educational videos to help people learn about wills, trust, and estate uh, matters. And you can also sign up for our monthly tax newsletter at this point. So I'm assuming that everybody wants to go through. I got a lot more material to cover. And I'm assuming everybody wants to spend another three hours. Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, I can take a hint. <laughs> you don't want to hear anymore. Oh I my like gosh. That. Oh, I'm going to have to stop because I've reached capacity. So I am done with the presentation and I would like to open it up for questions. Uh, yes. Very great presentation, Rex. Okay. We have a question here. After the death of their surviving spouse, is an EIN necessary to pay taxes on the estate? The answer is yes, because there's no other entity around. They might have a trust and they might have an estate separate, both or just um, one. But if there's going to be income, that's the key. If there's going to be income above $600 during a year, yes. <clears throat> okay. Um, I always thought someone on title as a trustee adding someone to title would need, would need to come on title as TIC and could not take title as joint tenants. What were those initials? I didn't catch the initials. TIC. Tenants in common. Tenants in common, yes. Okay. Could you ask the question again and I'll try to decipher sure. it? I always thought that someone on title as a trustee adding someone to title would need to come on title as tenants in common and could not take title as joint tenants. Okay, now I've got the question. <clears throat> we have a situation where we have, let's say a mother that has her house in a trust and there's a trustee on title and then Maybe she sells half of it or gets a new hot boyfriend and she wants to put him on title. And uh, how is that new person going to go on title? Well, the person giving the property away or selling it or the person buying it can decide. It can be held in tenants in common. So you have 50% in trust, 50% tenant in common. Or if you want to do the wrong thing, you can put the half in joint tenancy with the trust. So you have a right to use joint tenancy or tenants in common. You cannot use, because it's not true, community property with right or survivorship. You can also have a transfer on death deed, which is a different subject and quite a lot of problems with those. So we're talking about adding somebody and that's where the, tenants in common comes in and it's way different than just a change of trustee. Okay. All righty. If a couple's property was purchased in joint tenancy and then the property is funded into the trust without converting to community property with right of survivorship, what happens with step-up basis? Okay. The recommended method to handle joint tenancy when you're doing estate planning, we will take joint tenancy and deed it to themselves as, as a husband and wife, community property right or survivorship, then we will transfer it to the trust. The reason we do that is assets that go into a trust and later you change your mind and they're gonna fall out of the trust maintain the same character as they did when they came in. So 
if it was joint tenancy when it went in, if it ever comes out of the trust, it's joint tenancy. While it's in the trust, it doesn't matter much. But the preferred method is to get it out of joint tenancy before you fund the trust. Okay, great. Does the deed have to specify right of survivorship with community property or is it implied? It's not implied because you can have community property and maybe both spouses have separate wills and the property is going to be split. Um, don't play around with it. If your deed doesn't have it and you want it, change the deed to make it say that what it should say. Okay. And frequently what happens, this happens, we get property in husband and wife, it's joint tenancy, one spouse dies, and then those adverse effects on the half of the basis kick in. Not really, because in practice, if the house has been owned as community property forever, and that couple bought the house together, we just ignore the title joint tenancy. It's community property. If they were getting divorced, you can bet the divorce court would say it's community property. And that's how we treat it for um, spouses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Step up value is good, but what does it mean for someone who is a beneficiary that wants to keep the asset? Is property tax now based on step up value? I'm not going to answer that question because the next class has to do with real property taxation. And you'll notice I didn't say a word about real property taxes. Okay. So I'm going to leave that. Can you explain the process to distribute income from a bypass trust to beneficiaries? Specifically, you don't know the total income until the end of December when most mutual funds have large dividend payouts and you don't know all the expenses associated. So if this transfer does, isn't done by K-1 form, seems you need to do this in January, right? Okay, what we're talking about here is we're doing the right thing by trying to get the income out of the estate or trust. We have an unknown factor because who in the heck knows what that K-1 or 1099 is going to look like. So you take a good amount of distribution out that you estimate might cover it. And then you have, if you recall, there was a 65 day rule. So you work like crazy to get the, the uh, 1099 within 65 days from the year end, and you can backdate the distribution to occurring before December 31. And when all else fails, normally these are friendly people, you know, family, take out too much. You find out what it really is, put it back. Not a problem. Okay. If the property is already funded in joint tenancy, should one create a new deed from the trust to the couple in community property with right of survivorship, meaning can this be corrected? <clears throat> um, that's extremely convoluted in my mind. I'm not sure who's on first. Um, <laughs> if, if the asset is already in the trust, it's in the trust. Um, and if you wanted to be super squeaky clean you could pump it out to joint tenancy again and then do a deed to themselves as community property with right or survivorship and then put it back in the trust you could do that um another way is to do um uh, a declaration under oath that the property is in fact community property you know, community property in the state of California is optional. People don't know that. You There's a way to get married or during a marriage where community property doesn't affect you at all. But uh, that's a different subject. Okay. 
Um, so not quite sure on these. One of them, I mean, if it doesn't relate to the subject um, that you were speaking about, I'm not going to go over those. But um, here's after the death of their surviving spouse, is an EIN necessary to pay taxes on the estate? Um, yes, after what we have is a surviving spouse is deceased. So all the assets now are held either in an estate or in a trust or both. And the social security number of the surviving spouse can never be used again as of the date of death. And so, yes, there will be at least one new taxpayer ID number. And there may be two new taxpayer ID numbers, depending if both the trust and the estate have assets generating income. Okay, if not a POD and TOD, what is the best way to have money distributed? Okay, so a pay on death account is a contract between the vendor, the bank, the stockbroker, and the person who owns the assets. And it goes, it's not governed by a will or trust. The best way to do it is not do a pay on death account. Don't use it. Put the asset held by, let's say, a surviving spouse in her name as trustee. And then the trust governs. I, I really don't like pay on death accounts because of the adverse impact we get from um, the state and trust administration. Okay, that was the last question. Okay. Thank you so much. This was this was wonderful. I'm gonna have to go back in and, and review it. Um, yeah, this is wonderful. Listen, you might have to listen to it two or three times, look at the materials and the handouts and then take a break and go back and look at it. It takes a while. I mean, I know because I've had to review things four or five, six times. And, oh, now I get it. Yeah, uh, right. You got to get the vocabulary first and then you start working on the moving parts. So, Absolutely. Well, thank yeah. you so much. Again, another wonderful presentation. Um, everyone have a great evening. See you on the next one.